I'm Dr. Barry, licensed psychologist, and here I cover legal news from a psychological perspective. So I was in the chat with Lawyer You Know when he released this video talking about Sarah Boone's new letter. I was not expecting her to have another letter for her seventh attorney, and we're just going to watch to see what happens. There's a lot of other coverage that just covers the letter. I want to go deeper than that and talk a little bit about why I think she may or may not represent herself. We talk a lot about that victim versus survivor mentality. And lastly, individuals with certain narcissistic or certain personality traits can be extremely difficult. And just some tips for how to deal with difficult people. So let's first go back. To the last attorney, because when I was researching for this, I found two articles that I think really describe how we all feel about this. I will have a full link to everything shared down in the description. I found the letter over on Reddit, and so I don't have, I'm not sure if I have the direct link to that. We'll see. <laughs> so let's start with who Sarah Boone is. So Sarah Boone is sometimes referred to as the suitcase murderer because she's admitted to zipping her boyfriend in a suitcase. And what she describes is that she forgot he was in there. I did another video that I will link down in the description. There is a recording that she recorded on her phone of her kind of taunting him inside of the suitcase. And in my last video, I talked about her possible defense and what I thought about her self-defense. And a short synopsis of that video, I think that suitcase video, him in there begging for his life, letting her know that he can't breathe, I think that is pretty troubling. She's kind of laughing, saying that, like, this is how she feels because there was a history of DV within the relationship. It's my understanding that she normally called on him and... I don't know what was truly happening within that relationship. This is a great place to put my disclaimer. So I am a psychologist talking about this case. I do not know the ins and outs of her diagnosis or anything that's going on with her specifically. I'm just speaking in general about my opinions based on publicly available information. And this is in no way a psychological evaluation of Sarah Boone. I'm really interested to see, like, if they do get a mental health expert, I will definitely cover their testimony here because I think both the defense and the prosecution side, I would just love to hear what a psychologist truly thinks about this case. I will also talk about how the likability of a defendant, how that can sometimes help their case. And in my opinion, I don't think Sarah Boone comes across very likable. If you hear some of the things that have happened in this particular case. Now, it's fine if somebody, if they don't feel they're being represented properly, she's now on lawyer number seven. And you know that saying where like, it can't always be everyone else that the common denominator is. And I just, I don't think that she has the introspection to be able to look and be think, am I the problem? I don't think that ever crosses her mind. And we will... Talk about my thoughts on why that might be. You can probably already guess, but let's hop into this article. So this was back in September 2023, and she's been charged with second degree, capital M, and the death of her boyfriend. He went by George, but it looks like Jorge Torres, who was found inside a suitcase at the couple's apartment in on February 25th, 2020. Boone told police that she and Taurus had been drinking and playing a game, she said this, y'all, of hide and seek. And I said it last time, I'll say it again. I just played hide and seek with my kiddo the other day. Like, you don't hide the person and then try to find them. Like, that is not a thing. That is, that is not a thing. But that's what she said. And then they just mentioned that video that Boone recorded on her phone. That video is very, very difficult to, to watch. And I gave a trigger warning when I played a portion of that on the last video. Boone has gone through a number of attorneys in her case. Her initial attorney withdrew from the case in May 2022 and was followed by a series of public defenders who each left the case citing conflicts of interest. Frank Bankowitz was formally named Boone's attorney on July 11, 2022. Bankowitz filed a motion to withdraw on August. <laughs> citing irreconcilable differences. And I'm laughing a little because it's like it hadn't, like from July to August. 
But I think during that time, I think Sarah wrote multiple letters to the judge, really talking negatively about him. And this is a quote that this article has from Bankowitz. The defendant will not be satisfied with any attorney unless said attorney does not have a caseload and can dedicate his or her time solely to Miss Boone's case. Bankowitz wrote in a motion submitted to the court. The best possible avenue is to have the defendant represent herself as no attorney can satisfy her. I kind of get what he's saying. And yet, I honestly don't think that she wants to represent herself because then if it didn't go well, she wouldn't have anyone else to blame but herself. I think she likes having somebody else to blame or to point the finger to because I think it's always someone else's fault. She does not seem, in my opinion, to be the type of person that accepts responsibility for her actions or sees the error in her ways. Like that just does not seem to be something that she does. And so in a number of letters sent to Judge Wooten, Boone complained about not being able to communicate with him via phone due to him still not activating one of two numbers he's given that do not work. And he keeps giving me different reasons why each time I ask to keep trying. And I think when she says it doesn't work, I just think she means they don't answer. Because I think that comes up in another, like in her most recent letter, that there's something wrong with the phones. But I think what she thinks is wrong is that they don't answer. And the irony of it all is on the police body cam video, because her ex-husband is there when they're kind of talking to her and everything because she didn't call the police when she found her boyfriend deceased. She called her ex and her ex was the one who was like, you need to call 911. And she did. We listened to that recording in the last video. She just, she doesn't take responsibility for, for anything she does. But her ex was saying he was calling her every 30 minutes or so because it was her day to pick up their child from school. And she had had a history of not doing that. There are some allegations of possible alcohol abuse or at minimum misuse for her that she had had an issue with drinking, according to her ex. So this trial has been pushed back multiple times. I believe it was scheduled for May. And there's a chance that things could get pushed back again. We will see. Now, I did want to take a look at one other article that talked about this situation with the last attorney, not the most recent one, attorney number six. So this long crime article goes into some of the things that Sarah Boone has said because she always makes herself to be the victim in these situations. In a letter Boone wrote August 26th, 2023, she said, am I surprised my attorney is trying yet again to give up completely? No. Is it a blessing? Yes. Let's be honest. Frank Bankowitz is a dud of an attorney. He is unprofessional, hides, lies, and is disrespectful. Like This is a letter that she wrote to the judge. And this poor man has been practicing for years. And Bankowitz says, I can only say her claims are totally unfounded. I saw her on numerous occasions in person and by virtual conferences. It is not my job to babysit. It's to effectively represent my client. Miss Boone did not care that I have been in trial in murder cases for the last two months without a break. She wants an attorney who only has one case, hers. I moved to withdraw and that motion was granted after the court telling her basically what I have already stated. So let's get into the most recent letter. This letter is dated for January 19th, 2024. Honorable Judge Cranick, finally, a new judge. It's strange how the Lord works. As I was in the process of trying to disqualify Wooten after being my judge for four years. She didn't shut out the F-O-R, but my judge four years. And me still incarcerated with nothing to show other than seven different attorneys, not by choice. So once again, like not taking responsibility for her part in any of it. So I don't think she would admit that she can be difficult. Like, I don't think she thinks that she's difficult. I think there are at least six attorneys that would probably disagree. 
And when there's consistent feedback from multiple people, this is hard. There's a type of therapy called time limited, it's TLDP. What was it? There's a type of therapy called time limited dynamic psychotherapy. I was trained on it in graduate school many, many years ago. And in it, you would give the person feedback on how they were showing up with you in therapy. And that was a very common treatment that can be used with individuals with personality disorders for borderline personality disorder and also histrionic personality disorder. I typically do DBT skills training, but with this one, you're giving them feedback in real time of like, I'm kind of sensing, or this is how I'm experiencing you. Has anybody else felt that way? And yet there are some people that just can't take feedback. I truly think that Sarah just thinks it's everybody else's problem. And she probably thinks that she's a great client. New clips of me walking in and out of the courtroom and everything relative to my care permitted to be slathered on the global internet and in which I have not seen myself. And so I think people are telling her about what's being put on the internet. I thought he was the ticket holder to my overly hyped, illicitly distributed, misconstrued criminal case. And a great reason I am still here. Again, ongoing, four years and seven attorneys later, not by choice, see my letter dated 629-23 on Clerk's website. While still waiting to properly, oh, she used big words, elucidate. Is that how you say that? Mm. While still waiting to properly elucidate the court, and I had to look that one up, like that was, that was a big one. So to make clear, that's what that means public and world, after whatever the dysfunction was in the attendance part of my most recent PTC status hearing, which I'm trying to ensure my automatic attendance futuristically, please see my draft motion included. I am still trying to have my attorney submit on my behalf. So she wants to be at hearing. So I think what happened is she wasn't at a hearing that was just a status hearing. It's just, and they were just going to move a date or something. And she wasn't there. She wanted to be there and did not appreciate the fact that she wasn't there. I wanted to bring to your judicial attention the following information so you and the world are aware of it. I'm laughing a little because I think she knows that we all take a look at these things. So you and the world are aware it is not I who am ever delaying trial as Wooten improperly accused me of doing in a past hearing, especially now you have mandated a trial date to be had in May with no further continuances, leaving less than four months to put together and complete what should and could have been done already. What happened in all the four years prior? Please see all my correspondence online to date. So like, she just, she really doesn't have to do this. Like she puts the man, she puts the person's middle initial. Winston E. Hobson has been my court appointed attorney for 133 days and counting. To date, Mr. Hobson has only met with me one time for a total of three hours on 11 7 23. To date, no phone calls have been received by Mr. Hobson as his phone does not work properly for further immediate, much needed communication to be made between client and attorney. So I think she probably excessively calls, I'm guessing. I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing she probably excessively calls. And he's probably like answered her call a few times, I'm guessing, because this specifically says that she has not received a call from him. To date, I have mailed five letters to Mr. Hobson trying to communicate my urgent need to speak to him. I think this most recent attorney was the one that added personality disorders, like a specialist that can talk about personality disorders. I think that was this most recent one. And we don't know if that's personality disorder for her or personality disorder for the deceased. We, we do not know. I would guess it might be for her. And also they wanted a mental health expert that they could consult on related to the jury, like of just trying to find someone that might be 
sympathetic. I don't know if that's the word, but they wanted to do, they wanted the court to pay for a mental health consultant that they could talk to about jury selection. To date, I sent one letter to the investigator in my case, which she probably shouldn't have done, to contact Hobson to contact me, which like, so this is, these are triangles, <laughs> like, like the investigator to talk to her, like, ah, uh, oh, and see if he can assist in correcting the phone problem. Like, okay. Also to inquire when anyone is coming, anyone. To date, I feel I am not being included or heard or cared about in my case. And I, I do think that's valid. I do think that her perception is likely warped. So I think the minute her attorney pays attention to another client, all of the time that he's invested into her case, it's, it's completely gone. It's almost like object permanence. So object permanence is... We, we talk about this with, with kids because when kids are really, really young and they want something, you can hide it from view. If they can't see it, it doesn't exist. But once a kid has object permanence, if they want something and you hide it, they'll reach behind you to get it. They realize, oh, even though I can't see it, it does still exist. Sometimes individuals with issues with attachment or personality, and this could also just be pure manipulation. I, I do not know what is under this. I personally view manipulation as attempting to get needs met in inappropriate ways. Because there was an appropriate way for her to express to her attorney that she wasn't feeling seen and heard. And she likely tried to do that. The level of attention that she's demanding, I think, may go beyond what is appropriate for her case. So I think she would probably want her attorney to dedicate 40 hours a day, every day, just to her case. Cause she's like, you're trying to like, I think she would want them to only work on her case, but this is a public defender who they're not getting paid like by the hour. Sometimes they're paid by the case. I don't know how it works in Florida. Check in with a lawyer, you know, he's an attorney in Florida. Like normally public defenders, normally they have multiple cases and they do dedicate appropriate time because it would be a process for appeals if she didn't feel she had adequate counsel, but there would have to be a legal justification for that. And, and I haven't said it yet and I'll say it now. Her handwriting is impeccable. Her handwriting is gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. My handwriting is horrible. My handwriting looks like a doctor. <laughs> it's a, I have horrible handwriting. That's our squirrel moment for the day. If you are here, Okay, let me see if I can grab the squirrel. We have a squirrel. So I have a little squirrel that I keep back by the book now from the movie up. So these two will live over here. <laughs> back to this. Oh, I... To date, I feel I am not being included or heard or cared about in my case. Again, from the continued miscommunication again with Mr. Hobson and time-consuming, undiscussed entries are being made on my behalf, which is like his job. So, um, cause it should be in her best interest. The continuance I did not know about. The waiver of appearance I did not know about along with other documents. And I am never sent copies of anything filed. I keep trying to tell him about with no response furthering the already massive dysfunction in my four year case. I was hoping in the PTC status hearing on Tuesday, I could at least play catch up in the courtroom for five minutes. So many of my attorneys, oh, I think she means as so many, cause I think there's a word missing. So I think her other attorneys have caught up with her in the courtroom on court days, including Mr. Hobson in the one court date I've had for a continuance. 10 30 23 to express and emphasize the need for him to communicate and schedule a second very overdue meeting i still have not even heard from mr hobson about our missed ptc status hearing what's the status like her attorney has to tell her to date one out of 133 days and counting attorney and his client have met so i think she's going to list all of her grievances to date three out of now, wow, 3,192 hours 
attorney and client have discussed partial general case information to date. I have not seen my discovery. Your Honor, when is the next status hearing, please? Especially since I slash we were not at the last PTC status hearing. And especially since I am trying to communicate with my attorney in more than one way to fully maximize and utilize the minute amount of time allowed before trial, my fair, appropriate, lawful trial. I'm still wondering why, though I haven't had to wait for four years for something to finally happen on slash in my case. Judge Wooten, I wonder also, was I the oldest case on his docket? Oh my gosh. Either way, I'm still here waiting patiently and very excited to get this highly anticipated show on the road. I await your overdue and very needed judicial direction, supervise, supervision, and intervention. Thank you in advance. Wow. All right. So let's take a look at her draft motion. And like she has her case number. So like she's she's learned. If she didn't already know this stuff before, like she has learned a lot while she's there. And she cannot file like a draft brief. Like she can't file anything because she does have her own attorney. If she was representing herself, I think her attorney could view it, give her advice, but she would be able to file things with the court. That is what Daryl Brooks, he represented himself. He filed things with the court. In my opinion, he was a pretty difficult case, pretty difficult person. I did a video covering a portion of his case ooh, a while ago. Motion to be included in and allowed admittance to all defendants' pretrial conferences and hearings. Wow. And so I think that's what she's going to do. Just requesting that. Wow. Requesting to be present. All right. So let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about defendants like Sarah Boone and likability. To me, she comes across difficult. And even in some of the interviews, the police interviews, she can get snippy with people and let me show an example of that that that's what i did no by what like, the, this the facts of what happened we got there you said he, you pulled him out of a suitcase you said you went up you went to bed we're not assuming that these are the facts that you're telling us but now what we're said is like, oh i'm tired them. oh i'm tired well that's what you told me on a sworn recorded statement yesterday because when I said, oh, you went upstairs and passed out, you were like, no, I did not pass out. You got attitude with me because you were assumed, you yep. thought I was assuming that you were drunk. So that's that's an assumption. That was an assumption when I said yep. you passed out. And guess what? You corrected me. You were very adamant about the fact that both of you had your way out. <laughs> What's your favorite word to use? Compass mentis. You've used it today too, that, to say that you guys were within your, within your wits. <coughs> There's two two empty bottles of wine. No, but we didn't drink both of them. I think you did. We didn't. There's receipts for the same. They were both purchased there. yesterday, so I don't know how you didn't. Because they weren't there the day before. So There's one was. Two public receipts from yesterday. Mm -hmm. Only thing purchased on either one was a single bottle of wine. Two of them. So we have each bottle of wine that was empty in your garbage can that you purchased yesterday. Or he purchased, but you two would have consumed together. Okay, well, I, okay. I mean, there's receipts, so it's not even worth the going So back. this is, <coughs> so I don't know what you guys are, I don't, I don't know. We were just hoping that we could figure out why you. What was the motivation? There was no motivation. Well, well we're watching a video that after talking to you, everything was ha laughing and fun. Now we're watching a video where it's not laughing and fun. He's begging for his life, and you are in a very angry voice telling him to fuck off. No. Yes, not that's actually absolutely what it was. It's not an assumption. <laughs> the video is there. We played it for you. So you guys think that I intentionally... You did. It, you it, got it up on the couch you, it doesn't matter and walked what up we the couch. Think. Or walked up the stairs and got into bed. That was intentional. There's no way getting around that. You intentionally did that. Nobody drug you up there. 
You didn't float up downstairs. Okay, well, it's not fair. It's not fair that you guys keep trying to say that that's what I did. I don't know how to tell you. You told us that. You didn't go upstairs? <coughs> Again, there was a hole in a suitcase. I unzipped it from the hole with one finger. Well, the damn hole didn't do him no good, did it? But he could push it open. <coughs> no, he did couldn't. He? I, the video no. shows him pushing up. And if he could push it open, why wouldn't he have gotten out himself? Why would he beg you to open it? Okay. I tell you he can't breathe. Okay. If I, someone I, can I, do something for themselves, they're going to do it. They don't need assistance unless they need assistance. So, but why would he and start doing it? Because he couldn't, because it was all the way zipped. Okay. It. it wasn't. I intentionally didn't do it. That I intentionally did not do. What is that? <laughs> you intentionally do what? Zip it all the way. He nor I, nor I. Well, he's dead as a result lay of your action. on each other. He is dead as a result of I your action. I understand that. So That's why you this. You two didn't lay hands this. on each other. No. <laughs> no. I don't have anything. You're right. He doesn't. Uh, whatever that is, whatever this, whatever it he is. He does. <laughs> see, this is what happens. It's not fair that you guys, just because he has those, automatically blame it on me. Like, well, what about when you, when you had you, your injury? I think some of the things that will make this a little bit more difficult for her is I don't think she takes feedback very well. I think she externalizes blame. So there's something called locus of control. We want to have an internal locus of control where I manage my thoughts, my feelings. I feel like I can have an impact on the things that happen versus an external locus of control where everything just happens to me and I have no control. Nothing's ever my fault. That is an external locus of control, which is very common in substance use disorders and then also other mental health conditions as well. It can also be consistent with somebody that had valid victimization or trauma early in childhood or earlier in life. And then it becomes a pattern where they get stuck in that victim state and they never take responsibility for their part. They never take responsibility for their behavior, their feelings. Because if the lawyer's like, okay, I'm going to get to you when I can, I don't think that's good enough for her. Like when I can, I don't think that is good enough. And it's January and the lawyer may be thinking, okay, I'm trying to get this approval for this mental health expert. And that's my main focus and getting an updated mental health evaluation because I don't know that she's ever had a mental health, like a, a mental health evaluation by an expert for court. Now, while she's been in jail, there, she may be meeting for therapy. We'll never know because it'll only come into court if for some reason her competency was, was tested and she understands the court process. She knows how to properly engage with people. Just seems like Sometimes what she wants, she can get blinded by her needs, her thoughts, what she wants, and then doesn't realize that doing all these things makes things worse for her. Because then she says, this is unfair and doesn't take responsibility. Those are my thoughts. Those are my opinions. So let's move on to this quote. Life isn't exactly easy, but it's sure not as complicated and dramatic as some people will make it. Don't believe me? Take a break from the toxic people in your life and see what happens. And I think this doesn't only, because I think sometimes the word narcissist is used a little bit too loosely. In this case, it does seem like Sarah Boone does have a huge sense of entitlement. People have thrown different diagnoses around there. We won't know until she meets with a mental health expert and until they take a look at, at her personality. I do think a defense expert and a prosecution expert, they might see the exact same person slightly different because the person that the prosecution decides to go with is likely going to have a particular slant and the person that the defense decides to go with is going to have a different view. I love sharing resources with you all. And so here are some do's and don'ts for dealing with toxic behavior. Because I do think that we can learn things from situations like this. 
Dealing with a toxic person can be mentally draining, but employing certain communication techniques can help you protect your boundaries. So I can't control what the other person does. So Sarah Boone, she is going to write letters, but I can try to manage my response, my reaction, trying to not feed into their warped reality, gaslighting, or any other issues that are coming up. And so in the article, they share some signs of toxicity, and that can include a person that's very self-centered, uh, manipulation or other forms of emotional harm, dishonesty and deceit, difficulty offering compassion or empathy to others, a tendency to create drama or conflict. And here are some tips. So avoid playing into their reality. Some people have a tendency to see themselves as the victim in every situation. If they mess up, they might shift the blame to someone else or tell a story that paints them in a more positive light. You might feel tempted to nod and smile in order to prevent an angry outburst. This might feel like the safest option, but it can encourage them to see you as a supporter. Try respectful disagreement. Instead, you might say, I had a different take on that situation and describe how you see things. Stick to the facts without making accusations. Sometimes therapists will talk about making I statements, but even a person that is truly toxic will still try to warp things. And so sometimes you pick and choose those, those battles. Don't get drawn in. Dealing with someone's toxic behavior can be exhausting. The person might constantly complain about others, always have a new story about unfair treatment, or even accuse you of wrongdoing or not caring about their needs. Resist the urge to jump on the complaining train with them or defend yourself against accusations. Instead, respond with a simple, with a simple, so they recommend the, I'm sorry you feel that way. I sometimes just, I like the, I see things different or like, that's where you just kind of pick and pick and choose. Pay attention to how you feel. Sometimes simply being more aware of how someone's toxic behavior affects you can help you navigate interactions with them. Most people occasionally say rude things or hurtful things they don't mean. No one feels their best all the time. And being in a bad mood can make you lash out. This isn't necessarily toxic. But ask yourself and put downs, lies, or other types of problematic interactions, what do you think best summarizes their behavior? Do they seem to apologize or seem to notice how what they do and say affects you? Personal struggles do not excuse what the person is doing. You do not have to tolerate it either. I definitely think that you can set boundaries. This article recommends talking to them about their behavior, and that's where we talked about those, those I statements. I feel uncomfortable when I hear unkind things about our coworkers. I don't want to participate in those conversations. But like somebody that is truly toxic, that's where you're just going to pick and choose those, those battles. Put yourself first. And sometimes people can think this is selfish. And yet sometimes always people pleasing and always doing what's best for others, that can be a stress response. And being able to set those healthy boundaries with somebody that like when you leave their presence, you always feel drained. That might be a sign that I'm not setting healthy boundaries within that relationship. Offer compassion, but don't try to fix them. People can change, but they have to be willing to put in the work to, to do so. I think that's really important to remember. Say no and walk away. And that can be hard. Some people, they don't start with no, they start with the let me get back to you, or they start with something that's not as, because to me, no is a complete sentence. I should be able to say no, because when somebody asks me a question, they should be prepared for a potential no, <laughs> and I shouldn't have to explain it. But there are people that, and that's kind of a warning sign or a red flag. If when I tell someone no, if that, if they respond in an angry way, That could be a sign. And once again, not a sign that I never talk to the person, but it just might be like, oh, this person has trouble with not getting their way, has trouble with me setting boundaries. And I should, in safe and healthy relationships, I should be able to set boundaries. Make sure to be consistent with whatever boundary you set. I really like, it's uh, Domestic Blisters over on TikTok. I think she has, uh, she wrote a book called Struggle Care. 
um, and I covered a portion of her book, I think on the podcast. So my mom and I used to have a podcast. We stopped recording it. My mom might come and join me as just a guest on the show because things have kind of transitioned. So if you do see the Legacy Moments podcast, that is me and my mom. Uh, we did do our last episode, I think back in December. And um, but those old episodes are still up. But in one of them, we did cover Casey Davis's book, Struggle Care or Domestic Blisters. That's her name over on TikTok. She talks about how boundaries are not about the other person. It's not about controlling their behavior. It's about saying what I'm willing to do or what I'm not willing to do. So that a boundary is, if you yell, I'm going to leave. Like, if, if you don't stop yelling, I'm going to leave. Because then it's about what I'm going to do and not saying, I don't like it when you yell at me or don't yell at me. Because that makes the boundary all about them. And it kind of leaves me at their mercy of if they stop yelling. So instead to say, like, if I'm on the phone with somebody that likes to yell, scream and, you know, try to verbally, you know, say hurtful things on the phone, I always say, hey, you know, like this took an ugly turn, like, like I'm, I'm going to go. <laughs> and then I, like that might be the boundary of just click hanging up or Maybe a way that I set a boundary is if when I invite people over to my house, they never leave on time. So, hey, like what I might do is I might go over to their house because then I can leave when I'm ready to leave. <laughs> that when I set a boundary versus a request, that it be about what I'm what I'm going to do, what what I'm willing to do and where my my boundary is, what I'm comfortable with. Because I, I'm not in relationship with people that that yell and scream at me. I just my brain shuts down. Mm. I, I can't do it. And it's fine if people are loud, but like I'm talking about verbal aggression towards people. I don't, I don't do that. And one of the hardest things sometimes is to remember you aren't at fault. Toxic behavior can make you feel like you did something wrong, even when you know you didn't. Um, and so if I'm looking at a situation, I might need to restate my boundaries and they may take it personally and there's nothing I can do if they take me setting a boundary personally, because that if I hang up on that person that's verbally coming at me, they might think you abandoned me or you, how dare you? Like they, they might be really upset, even though I told them like, hey, we're not going to go there today. And they did. And I did what I did. Make yourself unavailable. So people who act in a toxic way can often sense who they can manipulate. They may move on when they see their tactics don't work for you. And that can be called gray rock. A lot of people hear about like being boring. So to someone who is kind of a narcissist that some people like your reaction. So they're trying to upset you. They're trying to get you to respond. And if you don't respond, if you just, if you just gray rock them, sometimes they'll move on to, to something else. Limit your time together. When you can't avoid the person, set boundaries. Have an exit strategy, change your routine, encourage them to get help. They might not, but you can always try. Don't get personal. And so the person interviewed said, be clear about how you are and aren't willing to engage. Toxic behavior can include gossiping, oversharing personal details, using personal information to provoke reactions, et cetera. Maintain calm, which is hard. Staying grounded. And they give some tips to stay grounded. And you can work on it with a therapist. I always have tips for how to find a good therapist in your area. So let me know what you think. Do you think Sarah Boone, do you think she'll ever represent herself? Do you think this attorney is going to hang in there? This happened on the 19th. I don't believe we've seen any type of response or anything because often, because to me, this is an issue between her and her lawyer and we may not find out like what happens. I think some of the other lawyers have withdrawn because I think all the other lawyers have withdrawn from her case because she's on lawyer number seven. This is lawyer number seven. 
If you like this type of content, if you would like more things like this, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. And if there are specific cases that you would like for me to cover, make sure to leave them in the comments. I don't, I can't cover everything, but I do like getting y'all's feedback. I sometimes research the case and if it seems like something that would be a good fit, because I always want to find what's the psychological aspect that I can cover to not just talk about a case just for the sake of talking about it. Because if I was going to do that, we'd talk about Becky Hill. Becky. Becky. Y'all think Becky's going to get charges? I don't know. Becky Hill. That was that was a bit of a mess. I followed it over with Emily D. Baker. I was in the chat coming in and out between clients. And then also uh, the lawyer you know covered it. And I'm sure the other people on LawTube will be covering it as well. Dr. G Explains also covered her body language and, and things like that, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to do a squirrel there.